welcome everyone back from lunch. I hope everyone got some food and some coffee. Um, so welcome everyone to track one post-lunch. We're here. We've got two more talks before the next coffee break. We're very lucky to welcome Nina here today. So Nina has spent many years being a software developer and now works with helping secure code. And she's going to talk about the lost top nine today using components with known vulnerabilities. Do you want CVE with that? So I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This mic works? Yes, very good. Cool. Thanks you. Thank you for coming to my talk. It's a lot of really good talks on at the same time, so I um, hope I won't disappoint. So <clears throat> um, I have written an awful lot of insecure applications in my lifetime, um, and I guess one day I just sort of woke up and noticed all those headlines in the papers. There's a data breach here, there's a data breach there. Um, there's even a website called databridgetoday.com. Like, it's bizarre. And I started looking into it because I was like, really, what's going on here? And, you know, it turns out that um, the way we write our applications uh, can be very insecure. It can cause a lot of damage. So, um, yeah, since then I'm on a bit of a mission to, to make the world a better place. Uh, at the moment, I work for a big bank. Um, if you would like to talk to me after, I'm super happy to talk on LinkedIn and Twitter. Please just hit me up there. I'm super happy to talk about uh, this topic. I'm very passionate about it. Um, um, I do have an employer. I don't speak on behalf of them today. Uh, and I will be talking about a lot of different products. I don't endorse any of them. Okay. So, this talk is sort of an introduction to software composition analysis, our dependencies and libraries. Um, so the agenda for today is first I'm going to bring everyone to, um, to sort of up to scratch and just have a brief chat about what is the problem and what's the proposed solution. And then I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent because I think a lot about these things and I need to get it out. You're just going to have to live with that. And then I'm going to try and make it more uh, practical and talk about some of the products we have in the market today and how they work and some differences between them because I've done a lot of research into this area and I think it could be uh, useful. So I'm happy to share uh, my thoughts on that. Uh, we'll have some demos as well to, so everyone can understand how these things work. Uh, and then finally I'll talk a bit about how you can um, go about introducing software composition analysis tools into your organization if you haven't already and how they work and sort of gotchas and things to think about. So what is the problem? There's the problem. <laughs> um, we all know the OWASP top 10, of course, that's why we're here. Um, in my opinion, I don't know about your experience, but I think we talk a lot about all the other ones except for A9, or at least have been like of the last sort of 10, 15 years. Um, there's a lot of, of courses that teach us secure programming, which is wonderful. Um, most people seem to be aware of what SQL injection is, what cross-site scripting is, and that's, that's great. I love it. Um, however, if you look at the impact of the breaches that are caused by using components with known vulnerabilities, it might be, well, be number one. Because um, it has huge impacts, as we will see. So, so that's the problem. So, in effect, when we when we write our application, so the business says, "Okay, this is the business logic. I would like you to go and code this, please." And we say, "Okay, no problem. I'll do that." So we sit in our ID and we program to the requirements. But if you think about it, what you write is only a very small fraction of the application that you deploy into production, right? because you're not going to write that JSON parser from scratch, you're not going to write the JDBC connector from scratch. The web framework, you know, who wants to know how the HTTP request and response are really, you know, processed? So you import a library, so you go import, blah, and voila, um, you have increased the size of your application astronomically. So if you look at what we call application composition, uh, um, a web application today is around 90% of it is components that you have not written. And about 10% is your custom source code that makes up the business requirements of the application. 
Uh, and this is good. This is a good thing. Because how else are we going to be quick to market and, and be agile? You know, when the business says, I want this done, and you say, great, I can have that done in a month. Or if you say, well, that will be about three years, I think. Hmm, uh, we don't want that. So we want to reuse components. It's wonderful. Um, the only problem comes about when we're not sure exactly which components we're using, which version, and are they secure? Um, so the proposed solution to this is called software composition analysis. Uh, and conceptually, it's very simple. Um, you inventory what you have in your uh, repo for your app, all the components, the names, and the versions. Uh, and then you look at uh, some source of um, vulnerability intelligence, like the National Vulnerability Database, for example. Or, um, there's lots of other sources. And they have also lists of components with names and version numbers and a vulnerability. And just do a mapping. And there you go, you have a result. So are you vulnerable or not? Um, so conceptually, <clears throat> quite simple. However, um, <clears throat> if you don't get it right, it can have very big impact. So we're going to change tack a little bit now and just have a look at one such consequence, which I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar with, but I'd like to talk about it anyway. Richard Smith is really earning that pension right now, taking a lot of heat. It was a contentious hearing from the get-go, a subcommittee of the House Energy and Commerce panel, taught, taking the former now retired Equifax CEO Richard Smith to tax for allowing the private information of Americans to be stolen. Both Democrats and Republicans delivering the shellacking. Listen to Jan Schakowsky, a Democrat from Illinois, and Greg Walden, the Republican chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. In the end, Equifax have had, has had to apologize for its post-breach response almost as much as it has apologized for the breach itself. Equifax deserves to be shamed. How could a major U.S. company like Equifax, which holds the most sensitive and personal data on Americans, so let them down? So here is what Smith had to say for his part, an apology. Listen. And as CEO, I am ultimately responsible. I take full responsibility. I'm here today to say each and every person affected by this breach, I'm truly and deeply sorry for what happened. I think this is a very uh, fascinating story. It, it puts into context what we do in application security. Here we have the CEO of a huge American corporation apologizing to the US Congress effectively because they were using a vulnerable component and got pop, you know? So it has impact. So um, to bring it back to a, a geeky level, this is the root cause of the Equifax breach, right? Apart from obviously the fact that, you know, there were attackers who were skilled in exploiting it, but this is the vulnerability. <clears throat> Basically, uh, Apache Strauss is a Java web framework, right? Uh, it's open source. Some, you know, someone has written it, a lot of people probably. And when this somebody wrote um, part of the file upload functionality, they didn't quite get the um, exception handling and the, um, the error message generation that happens after that write. So they were using something called ognals, which is like an expression language. So you can insert something and it will be interpreted um, using Java reflection introspection at runtime. So you can access and change the object graph. Uh, and voila, you have remote code execution. <coughs> um, so re the result of this lack of uh, you know, exception handling in a correct way was that um, enormous amounts of people lost their personally identifiable data. So it turns out that Equifax is a credit reporting agency. So when you go to your bank uh, and for some reason or other they, you know, uh, they need to do a credit check on you, they submit all this data to Equifax, if you're American that is. Um, 
well, you know, so they had everything from social security number, the address and telephone number, driver's license, ca- um, credit card numbers, even copies, like digital copies of your, your passport and things like that that they needed for their credit reporting. So it was a huge impact for the people who, you know, had were in this database, which was most Americans as far as I can tell. Um, it also had a huge business impact, of course. This is the share price. It just like, yoink, plummeted. Um, they have class, you know, class action lawsuits everywhere. Um, a lot of executives had to go. So yeah, it was a it was a big impact from a lack of software composition analysis, I would say. <coughs> um, something that's interesting and worth thinking a little bit more about here is the timeline. So, what are we actually talking about when it comes to a known vulnerability? So, in this case, uh, obviously the vulnerability was introduced at some point. We don't know when. Doesn't really matter. And then in February 2017. Uh, someone finds this vulnerability. Uh, and um, Apache um, you know, gets notified. It takes them about a month to issue a patch. That's all right. It's not too bad. Uh, and then well, two, three months after that, um, some attackers figure out that uh, Equifax is using this particular library. They haven't updated. They're still vulnerable. They get in there. They spend a good three months in there exfiltrating everything that they could possibly want. And then eventually they get discovered, and yeah, the rest is history. So what this means is that we have a timeline, we have a race between the organizations who use components and the attackers. So as I said, vulnerability is introduced, and then there will be a timeline where it will be discovered, and there will be uh, likely an exploit published as well, because why not, right? And then once that has happened, there's a race on, will the organization realize first that yes, we use this component and yes, we are vulnerable, or will the attackers get into your system before that happens, right? Uh, And that's what we're playing at here. But let's take a little step back again. So we talked about component reuse. It's a good thing. Of course it's a good thing. Let's have a little think about other disciplines of engineering. Because software software discipline is relatively new, and it's not alone. There's lots of engineering disciplines. So what what do they do? Well, it turns out that, of course, the car industry does what we do. They reuse, right? To develop a car and all the components in it is really expensive. It takes a lot of expertise. It costs a lot of money. So once you've done that, you want to get maximum value out of it. Uh, so what the car industry does is something called the car platform. So effectively, the Fiat Chroma, the Cadillac BLS, and the Opel Vectra C are basically the same car with a bit of, mm, you know, decorations, right? Much like our software applications, remember? About 90% it is components, and about 10% is our sort of business logic sprinkle on top. Um, and, and it's great. Again, like, they can be quick to market, they can be cost effective, that's wonderful. But again, what happens if there is a defective component? (laughs) Um, Turns out that uh, there was a defective component in the car industry as well. Um, In particular, there was an airbag made by one particular company, what was a particular model, and BMW, Chrysler, Ford, Honda, Mazda, Nissan, and Toyota were all using the same airbag. Turns out it was defective, it killed people, it injured people, and that these car companies had to recall over 3 million cars worldwide in 2014. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's good to use components, but we need to be aware of what we're doing and have some type of quality control over this. Um, if you think a bit further about what other engineering um, disciplines do, there's something called preventative maintenance, and it's even a whole discipline of engineering called maintenance engineering. Um, <clears throat> it's natural for other engineering disciplines to do this. They don't just install it once and forget about it. Like they don't just install struts two in you know 2001 and then 2018 you go oh whoops. Um, they keep track of which components they have, and they have. For example, in the, in the airline industry, it's highly regulated. 
And I talked to actually an airline engineer about this, and they have very detailed processes um, for how they maintain their components. So every time they do maintenance, they write down which component was replaced and with what, and when it's due to be replaced again. And when that time comes, they replace it, even if it's not broken, because that's the standard, because it's very important, because we want to keep people safe. We can't just have airplanes dropping out of the sky because we put you know, a component in there and, oops, it was vulnerable. That's just tough. So, I don't know. I just think that we, as, as a community of developers and AppSec people, need to step back and think a little bit sometimes, like, what are we doing wrong? Um, Another idea that came to mind was uh, rolling distribution, like um, Arch Linux, for example, use something called rolling distributions, which is, it up the, it, there's no like, fixed version, like, oh, now you go from version 7 to version 8. No, it's rolling distribution. You get upgraded all the time. If there's something new, you get upgraded. Um, and I can see, you know, working for a large organization that the developers will go, whoa, whoa regression testing, no, break stuff, Ooh, you can't do that. But I don't know, this comes back to a lot, what a lot of other talks have mentioned today as well, that security is really nothing but quality. Um, we should have full you know, test coverage, right? So it shouldn't be a problem. Um, anyway, yeah, um, please keep these thoughts and uh, come up with another talk, and I'll come to your talk. Right. <clears throat> Okay, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, ah, that's supposed to happen. Yes. Thank you all the same. <laughs> tools. <laughs> Let's talk about tools. So, to implement our software composition analysis, we need tools. We need tools for everything. We use lots of tools all the time in our industry. That's what we do. So, let's talk about them. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to software composition analysis, there's a few things we need to consider. Um, for example, where in the software development lifecycle are you going to figure out which dependencies um, you're using and if they're vulnerable or not? Are you going to shift all the way left so that it, when you start typing import blah or whatever you do in your ID, uh, there's a little flag saying, whoa, don't do that, that's crazy. Use this instead. Um, and then you can go all the way through, you know, uh, your, um, your source repo, your package manager, you build uh, servers, repo, and so on, all the way to prod. Um, so something to consider there is that, of course, if you do it as far left as you can, you get an early warning, and you may not ever get that vulnerable dependency into your uh, application. That's good. Could also be really annoying for the developers, uh, and maybe whatever they were using then wasn't actually going to end up in prod anyway. So it's just a bit of a nuisance. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you go to all the way to production and you scan your production application, um, whatever is in production, um, on the upside, you'll have 100% like true positives. It's like, yes, this is in production. It's definitely there. And this is um, not a false positive. On the other hand, it's kind of too late <laughs> by then. So you want to sort of find your sweet spot, and you don't have to pick one or the other. You can do many, too. Oh, um, this particular slide is stolen from one of the vendors that just point out um, all their different integration points, um, and that's something we'll be talking more about. <laughs> so let's have a little think about tools. For um, software composition analysis, like, what should they do? Well, first of all, um, you need to find a tool that supports your language and the, the other tools that you're already using. So if you're using you know, Java and Maven and Jenkins and Artifactory, you know, then you wanna, and you want to integrate it at those point, points in your development lifecycle, you want to make sure that your tool covers those. So you just need to find that out. Um, they also need to have a feature where they inventory your components um, because that's um, 
really a key aspect of this tool because it's really hard to actually get a good grip of which components you have. Like if I asked you today, you know, which dependencies do you have? You'd be like, oh, uh, I don't know. I think we use Spring. Which version? Uh, I don't know, four, I think maybe. Oh yeah, but which minor version? I don't know. Um, and then they need to supply intelligence on uh, vulnerable components in some way. And then, of course, they need to be able to explain this to you in a, in a way that you can consume in your organization. Um, so I'm going to just have a little talk about a few of the current options. Obviously, these are not all of them, so apologies if someone feels that their tool is not covered. Um, uh, others off the top of my mind, source clear, MPN audit. Uh, look, it's a good thing. There's lots of tools, and that's a good thing. We're finally waking up to the fact that this is a really important area. So, um, for no reason, I'm just going to start with SNCC, because why not? Um, I'll also demo SNCC real quick. Um, when we come to the demo sections, you can see how it works. But um, they cover Node, Java, Ruby, Python, Scala, Golang, .NET, PHP, and Docker, and these particular other um, excuse me, um, technologies. Um, they basically hook into the dependency manager and read the manifest, uh, which is quite common. I think most tools work like that. Um, and if you try and read up on where they're getting their, uh, open, their intelligence on, on vulnerabilities from, it's Look, all of the vendors, to be honest, um, except for the open source ones, say, oh, you know, we have the, we have the absolutely best um, source of intelligence for this, and, and we all not, don't just look at the National Vulnerability Database. We look at this, this, and that, and we have dedicated, you know, research teams that sit around and do nothing but read, you know, change logs on GitHub or whatever. Um, it's hard to know, obviously. I think you're just going to have to find out for yourself. Um, but yeah, that's how they generally um, differentiate themselves. Um, SNCC is quite nice in that it, it has everything from like, it can be free uh, if you want, and then you get, you, get, you, know, you get some features and it works, right? But if you want um, you know, all the, the other uh, uh, stuff like specialized reports and dashboards and all that, then yeah, you know, you're gonna have to pay money and I think that's fair. <laughs> So, in my experience, this are just my personal thoughts, um, SNCC is incredibly easy to get started with, which you'll see uh, in a demo later on. Um, I think it's nice that they have that pricing range, like from free and then it's staggered. Um, they're very, uh, they seem very keen, but they quite, they uh, feel new and very like pumped, put it that way. Um, <coughs> Um, I was giving a similar talk to this uh, a few weeks ago at a developer conference and, and uh, I, after a guy from Norway came up to me and was like, hey, you didn't talk about Retard.js. I was like, yeah. He's like, that's my project. I founded that. <laughs> so Retard.js, it's a bit different than the other ones. That's why I didn't talk about it. But it's been around for quite a while. Uh, it's very well regarded. It's for JavaScript only. So if you use a lot of JavaScript and you like to see um, how vulnerable your client side JavaScript libraries is. It's a great tool. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't find out all that much information about where they get their vulnerability data or how they inventory exactly, but I think it's just parsing the page and then report on that. Um, and they integrate a bit differently, like they have a browser plugin, um, so you can see straight away. So if you go to any page, Actually, let me do that. Let me just show you real quick. Um, <clears throat> let's just say we go to like nine or something, yeah? And then you have a little plugin in here. That's retire.js. And then, oh, sorry, sorry. Let me move it. I'll move it real quick, I think. There we go. Not the old Mac. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so if we go to nine, for example, just to pick on them, because why not? Uh, it, it just reads the source code on the page and tells you, yep, these people are using these libraries and they're vulnerable to that. And that's, that's kind of nice. Um, do, 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 do. Right, let's 
see if I can wiggle back to this. Da, 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 da. There we go. Um, yeah, they're also automation friendly um, in that you can, you, they have a plugin for uh, Zap uh, and Burp and Grunt and Gulp, and they also have a CLI tool. So yeah, have a look at that if a client-side JavaScript uh, vulnerabilities is your um, concern. JFrog. JFrog is probably most famous for Artifactory at the moment. Which is a binary repo. And I think also if you have like the most high-end license, I think X-Ray comes for free, so you may already have it, who knows. Um, what I gather from X-Ray is that it does the introspection of the binaries in the repo really well. That, that's its, its claim to fame. Um, so it doesn't just look at the um, dependency managers manifest, it, it goes much deeper than that. Um, so that's what it specializes in. Um, it comes with a very basic uh, source of intelligence uh, on vulnerabilities, but it has sort of native hooks into Black Duck, White Source, and Snake, which are other vendors. Uh, so it's just a different, uh, different model, <clears throat> I suppose. Um, yeah, so that's the thoughts on that. Um, depending on how you use Artifactory, you it could be quite far right in the development tool chain. Like, I mean, yes, you would store your components in Artifactory, I suppose, and then pull them from there during development, and then that would wouldn't be too far um, right. But if you are introspecting, like the dependencies, oh sorry, the um, the ready-made applications that you're about to put into production, because that's also a binary, right? Then, yeah, again, you have that high confidence in the results, but could be a little bit too late to fix. <coughs> um, white source um, is the is another one of these really big. It feels very enterprisey. It has a lot of integration points. That's basically what you. I think with these really big commercial companies, you pay for out-of-the-box integration points to everything you could ever want to integrate with, and um, quite good vulnerability intel feed. It is not just the national vulnerability database, it's everything else as well, and it's sort of been triaged a bit too to um, adjust the, uh, the score. <coughs> uh, for those who use Aqua, um, if you use software composition analysis through them, they basically use white source in the background. Um, they also have a Chrome plugin, which is kind of interesting. So like if you go to uh, Maven plugin, uh, sorry, Maven Central or whatever, and you know, it lists all these uh, components, it can tell you straight off the cuff, oh, well, here's a vulnerable one. Um, unfortunately, because they're so enterprisey, I don't have, uh, I can't show you because I don't have a license because you know, that requires my salespeople to talk to your salespeople and all that, so. Um, Black Duck, on the face of it, is rather similar to White Source in like the market that it's targeting. Uh, enormous amounts of integration points seems like a very mature solution. Um, they also have a wholly sort of on-prem solution for those organizations that don't want to have any of the vulnerability data leaked to um, a vendor's uh, SaaS. You know, governments, banks, those kind of people are a bit paranoid for good reason. <laughs> Um, <coughs> um, they have a pretty good dashboard, but um, when it comes to reporting, like they are very export friendly as such. They have good APIs and good export capabilities, but they don't have any native uh, reporting capability built in, which I guess is okay, because then you can rely on your favorite reporting tool to, to do that for you. But that's a kind of a little gotcha to be aware of when you evaluate these products. Uh, yeah, and it also only runs on Docker, which is fine. If you have your Docker platform there, you can just plonk in your containers and you're up and running in no time. But if you're not, then yeah, you have a bit of a, a steep um, curve <laughs> to get it. And they also have a Chrome plugin similar to, uh, to White Source. So, <clears throat> this is uh, OWASP AppSec Day after all. Of course, there's also an OWASP. Um, alternative, an open source alternative. Um, as has been mentioned in previous tracks, um, 
dependency check has been around forever, uh, and it's it's great. Um, it's in that it has been around forever to bring up, yeah, to, to, to be a tool for us to, to use so we can see our, com our components and vulnerabilities. Um, but it has been lacking a little bit in how you can automate it, perhaps, I think it's fair to say. So, uh, voila, now we now have a dependency track. Um, so dependency track will basically take a bill of material, as in your inventory, of your, what components you're using and ingest that. So that can be different formats, so Cyclone DX, SPDX, dependency check, one of those. Um, and then it says, okay, these are the vulnerability intelligence sources we use. It's refreshing to actually get a clear answer. So national vulnerability database, etc. cetera, right? Um, it supports, uh, so RubyGems, Maven, and NPM at the moment, I'm sure that I can Expand. If you have nothing better to do, you can always write your own um, integration layer there. For notifications, um, you have these, and then of course there's a Jenkins plugin. I have not seen a single tool that does not have a Jenkins plugin, to be honest. Um, which is good if you use Jenkins. Uh, so, without further ado, um, let's do a little demo so we can see what they actually look like. So, oops, there we go. Eh, sorry. <laughs> so let's start with the dependency ch uh, check. Yes, you do. Thank you. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> let's see if I can move this thing. Come on. I can do it. Yeah. Not. Damn it. Uh, ah, there we go, hang on, maybe. Oh. Mm. Right, I might just have to change the, the what's it called, setting, with the, um, the, the screen settings, I think I'll do that. I'm going to display, I'll just change this here, uh, arrangement, mirror, mirror, yeah, that should work right, cool, I'm done, um, do, 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 do. here we go, so, meep, oh no, stack trace, okay, um, uh, can people read that, yeah, okay, great, so, um, Here's an example of good old um, dependency check. Um, as is usually the case for these tools, there's many ways you can use them and integrate them into your build pipeline. So here's an example of using um, Maven. So you just have a little plugin uh, that will um, check your code for um, vulnerable dependencies. So without further ado, let's See if we can do that. So basically, you just go like Maven um, verify. So this is the Struts app that I've done that I've forked from the official Struts examples um, on GitHub. So it's not like I've downloaded uh, the deliberately vulnerable app. Um, it's just a normal Struts app. Anyway, um, <laughs> right, so the result here is that um, we have some vulnerabilities. And it says here, see the dependency check report for more details. All right, let's do that. Uh, oops, there we go. Here it is. So a bit small, isn't it? Um, yeah, so we'll give you a nice sort of HTML page where you can read all about it. Um, so a perhaps more automated way to do this would be to use the Jenkins plugin. So let's have a little look at that. Uh, Jenkins, here we are. So um, for this one, I've just I'm just um, I'll show you what I've what I've done rather than make it from scratch again. It just takes forever. Um, 
it's just a normal sort of um, Jenkins job. So it's the GitHub project. I'm just checking out. I've just cloned, uh, forked web, uh, WebGoat, or was WebGoat, into my own repo. Here it is. Yep. Uh, and it's very simple. It just, here's the POM. Do a clean and install. And here we have in the post steps, we have the invoke dependency check analysis. So because I've added that here using the, the add post step, uh, post build step, it just does that. I don't have to provide any uh, further information. I can if I, if I really want to, but uh, I don't want to. Um, and then we also have a post build action where we publish um, the dependency check results. And we're going to publish that to the dependency track. So, and that's the, the whole configuration. So what it does is it grabs it from Git, um, runs the Maven clean install, uh, runs it through dependency check to get the inventory of which components are in use, and then passes it on to um, dependency track for more, yeah, so we can track it and have a look. So basically I have run this job, and here's our web goat. So let's have a look at that. <clears throat> uh, lots of, of pretty graphs and all the information you could want about this. So here's our project, for example. So let's have a look at our components. Um, so it lists all the components, all 328 of them, because remember there's transitive components as well, yeah? And if we have a look here, we can see uh, what vulnerabilities we have. So let's have a look at something and where it came from as well. That's interesting. So, yeah, and it has some inf more information about it, and this is obviously just coming from the uh, provider of that uh, vulnerability uh, information. So sometimes it has recommendations what you should do. Here it does, for example, you should upgrade to this particular ladder version, and that's the, the normal kind of, here's your solution, you should really upgrade it because there's a patch, right? <clears throat> I only uh, forgot to ask you guys, any questions, please shout out if or anything you want clarified or anything's confusing. Let me know. And so that was that. Let me do, 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 do. that. Snick. Okay, let's have a look at Snick as well. So Snick also has um, a command line tool. Um, when you go snick test. And it's just looking at the POM, really. Um, can you see that? Oh, yeah. Ooh. Okay. All right, it found 14 vulnerabilities. Um, so obviously you could, you know, you could script this and put it into your, to your scripts where you need it. Uh, or you could, there's also Jenkins plugin uh, let's have a look at the snick. Uh, oh, hang on, not there. Uh, here. Let's have a look here. Snick. Let's have a look at what it looks like. I'll log out just to start from the beginning. So let's say that you have never done any. Um, analysis on your components, right? And you just go to snick.io, this is what it looks like. Use open source, stay secure. Sounds good to me. So, uh, there's a big promise here. It says, develop a first solution that automates finding and fixing vulnerabilities in your dependence. Well, that sounds like the holy grail, doesn't it? So, uh, let's just uh, log in. And I'm just gonna log in with GitHub, because why not? <coughs> Uh, and here's all the different integrations that you could use, depending on where you have your code. Um, and this is what I mean with the, uh, the on-prem solution versus the uh, in-the-vendor's SaaS solution. Um, this is perfectly suitable for my forked version of WebGoat, but it may not be that suitable for the bank's um, internet bank. Uh, let's just pick one of my webgo. Uh, sorry, uh, GitHub projects. Uh, yeah, it's the webgo because because why not? So we add that to Snick, and it's going to have a little think about that. 
It doesn't take too long, usually. Have a look at the log, see what's going on. Processing, that's good. Oh. oh, come on, be quick. I guess Web God is, is quite big. Uh, maybe we should pick another one. Um. I've been running mine for like five minutes. Really? Yeah, that's oh. Maybe there's something wrong on their end. Wow, so maybe there's something wrong on there because you know this is um. Yes, it was you, wasn't it? I, yes. Let's pick a smaller product just because why not? And we'll see. But yeah, I'm thinking you might be right. It might just be broken. Um, no. Maybe not. Halfway, half down. Is it half full or half empty? Hmm. That's all right. Let's just. Oh, there it is. Woo so uh, this is another um, product on GitHub that I've forked. It's the um, Damn Vulnerable Node application, uh, which is really good to play with if you want to learn more about application security. So um, SNCC has now analyzed this based on the package.json file. And it has found that there are four high vulnerabilities and three medium vulnerabilities. Hmm, OK. So let's have a look at that. Ooh, arbitrary code execution, ouch. Okay, that's no good. So it tells us the details of uh, what's wrong. So this particular library is vulnerable. Oh, there's no patch available, mm, that's no good. That happens sometimes. And then you just, at least you're aware of the fact that you have um, that problem, I guess. And then you have to do risk analysis on that. Uh, but there are ones where there are mediations you need to upgrade. So SNCC is very nifty in that, because remember how it promised that it would automate the fixes, right? It actually does that. Uh, let's just see, it says, choose, cho um, choose how to fix these vulnerabilities and open a pull request. So let's just click open a pull request and see what happens. So there you go. I can check which ones I would like to have fixed. And unfortunately, I can't fix those, but I can fix uh, these. So that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. So it's just going to generate the pull request for me, which is nice. And it will even add a nice little description of what's going on. It's doing some checks. That's good. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy, you know. So yeah, what could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, this is when you have to rely on your test coverage. So we have uh, done the pull requests. That's lovely. And and uh, now if we go back to, 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 to SNCC, I suppose. Let's go to SNCC. Log in again. Oh, ah, there we go. Oh, now we have WebGoat. Oh, OK. Uh, so now I can't. Sorry, what's that? Sorry? Yeah, now we have more. No, what have we done? Okay, yeah. No, so now <laughs> it's finally finished processing WebGuard, which is kind of huge. Um, so, yeah, there you go. And, yeah, that's, I think that was it for demos. Yeah. So, yeah. So now what? <laughs> um, so, we... I think, I hope, really, that you have an idea of why you should be doing software composition analysis. Uh, and you know that there are some tools out there. So that's good. Now what do you do? Well, have a little think about, well, analyze your requirements. Start from the beginning. Which tools and languages do you use in your organization? Start in that end. Have a think about which, what budgets you have um, and the number of developers who will be using this, because the licensing is usually based on how many developers will be using it. Uh, have a think about 
the other integration points uh, that are important to you? Like, do you, do, is it really important to use Jira? Is it really important to use Bamboo? Um, obviously, the more mainstream technologies are usually covered, uh, and the less mainstream ones may not be covered, right? So you just need to check that the tool you're picking covers those. Next step is that your tool will be creating uh, the bill of materials for your inventory. So you know exactly which components, which version you're using. That's wonderful. And then you will compare this, the tool will compare the bill of materials to uh, the vulnerability intelligence and map the two, remember? And then we panic because we go, shit, oh my god, you know, I had no idea. Because it's so much easier to have your head in the sand and just like go, la la la, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> uh, but once you actually find out, you can't unsee it. And that's a real problem that, yeah requires um, psychological preparedness, I would say. So you go through the phases where you first deny it and then you get super angry. How can the developers have done this? This is terrible. And then you try to bargain. Uh, perhaps that's your risk acceptance process. Um, and then you just get really sad and we're all screwed and we're gonna die. And then finally, hopefully, you accept it. And you go, right, well, this is the situation. Let's just get on with it, right? So. You have probably a defect management process. If not, you should have it. Um, this is just another type of defect, and you're just going to have to manage it like a defect, right? So put it into your Jira, your remedy, or whatever you use, right? Um, and patch, 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 patch. Please patch, you know? And because you have full test coverage, regression testing is easy, remember? Um, and once you've sort of gone through this and, and removed the worst offenders, um, then what do you do? Then you come into the sort of next maturity uh, phase where you need to detect the vulnerabilities before they get into production in the first place, right? Um, yeah, and then it comes back to this preventative maintenance uh, thinking of not letting it get in there and continuously monitor uh, which, are, which components you're using. And if they're vulnerable, because even though you may not introduce a new component, guess what? Your old component could become vulnerable tomorrow because it's new vulnerability is coming out all the time. After that, struts um, vulnerability we talked about, there's been more struts vulnerabilities and spring frameworks vulnerabilities. Like it never ends, right? Um, yeah, and then be quick. Get, you know, figure it out before the attack is due. Um, and then, you know, uh, thinking off the top of my head, you know, perhaps you'd like to have a whitelisted repo where on, that's the only place that the developers can pull from and then you monitor that repo. You know, there's all sorts of solutions. It really depends on your organization and the culture and the processes you have. And um, that was all I had to say on that topic, but I'm super happy to have all the questions. And if you're too shy, you can always come talk to me after too. Always happy to talk. I was just about just thinking about putting in the, the, the fourth dimension. Yeah. We're talking about a problem that really applies well, where you're working with the local one about just fine. But I'm an independent developer. Yeah. I do work on about five projects here. Yeah. Yep. And over three years, you've got a project that you see, so you know that all these come in. Yeah. But you can't keep going back to people and say, oh, that thing I did for you five years ago has got vulnerabilities. Because I think, well, you know, that was your fault. But you know, what, what do you do? Like, is, is there a room for the developers to build anymore? Because you can't actually pay everyone for the time they're going to use the application. It's a, a cash 20 situation. Well, what do you do? I don't know so much. I think, you know, this patch Tuesday. Uh, Microsoft is, is happy to announce to the world that they have vulnerabilities and that they're patching them. I, I kind of disagree with you in a, in a way that, that your customers would be upset if you come back to them later and say, oh, actually, you know, I have to patch your application because I've now discovered there's a vulnerable component in it. I think they would appreciate that, um, to be honest. But I, I haven't spent a great deal thinking about your 
um, scenario, to be honest, because that's not where I'm coming from. But yeah, it's an interesting question. But yeah, in all honesty, I think I, the customers should appreciate updates. And you can point to every, I mean, everyone has phones, right? The apps get updated all the time. Microsoft has Patch Tuesday. This is a normal thing now that, you know, there's patches and updates. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up? Oh, it's been a good chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.